Hello, everybody. I am Aishan Hutchinson, the director of the Creative Writing Program here at Cornell. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to the fifth and penultimate event in the spring 2021 Barbara and David Zalaznik reading series together. The final event of the series will be on Thursday, April 29th. Please check out our website for more details and to sign up to be added to our email list. The series is made possible thanks to the generosity of our donors, Barbara and David Zalaznik, to whom we extend our bountiful thanks. This evening's event features the acclaimed writer, Susan Choi, who will be reading from a remarkable short story, Flashlight. Choi will be introduced by my colleague, Professor Stephanie Vaughan, who will moderate a conversation with Choi after the reading. You can participate in the conversation by submitting questions in the chat throughout the event. A final reminder that this event has been recorded and the recording will be available to view at the same link afterwards. Now, over to you, Stephanie. Thank you, Aishan. Audience, welcome, all of you readers and all of you writers. Susan Choi was born in Indiana and grew up in Texas. She was educated at Yale and then at Cornell, where she was admitted to the joint degree MFA-PhD program, but decided after the MFA program and after teaching for two years as a lecturer to leave Cornell and make her way in the world of fiction. She worked for a time at the New Yorker, gave birth to two children, and now she commutes from Brooklyn back to Yale, where she teaches creative writing. Since leaving Cornell, she has published five novels, none of them like any of the others, all of them well-received, some of them prize-winning, all of them nominated for prize, prizes. In 1998, which was not long after she left Cornell. She published The Foreign Student, a novel about a Korean student who has come to the United States to pursue a graduate degree at an American university in the South, where, among other things, he is falsely accused of theft. It won the Asian American Literary Award for Fiction, so right out of the gates, she won a big prize. In 2003, she published American Woman, a book inspired by the Patty Hearst kidnapping from the 1970s. Although the principal character in the novel is not Patty, the Patty Hearst figure, but the Asian American woman who was one of her keepers during the more than a year of Hearst kidnapping ordeal. American Woman was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize and recently has become a feature like film. Uh, you can watch the film, you can stream the film, and I think we might be able to give you uh, the link to that. <clears throat> Next, in 2010, she published A Person of Interest, a novel inspired by the activities of the Unabomber, Ted Kaczynski, as well as by, uh, by the story of Wen Ho Lee, the Los Alamos scientist whom the government publicly and falsely charged with stealing nuclear secrets to give to China. That is, they picked the Asian scientist and accused him of giving secret American secrets to an Asian country, thereby upending his life forever. The later the charges were dropped, that book won the Penn W.G. Sebald Award. And I can't think of a writer who, who, for whom, with whom it would be a greater honor to have your author's name linked. Um, that's an extraordinary award. Next, in 2014, she published My Education, the story of a college student who has an affair with a much older person, or persons, actually. It won the Lambda Literary Award for Bisexual Fiction. And finally, her latest novel, published in 2019, won the National Book Award, and that is a very big prize. It begins as a story about teenage obsessive romantic and sexual desire, and then turns into a different kind of book when the narrative suddenly, exuberantly, shockingly changes direction. The shifts in perspective and the obsessive, self-consuming personalities in the book are so potently, beautifully drawn that you really cannot put the book down once you start it because you are living that story. 
One of the tropes that tracks across all five books is a question about identity formation, how you discover and hold on to who you are, and how who you are may be defined or even erased by those around you, or even an entire culture that you have to put up with. Whether you are perceived as the teenage, sexy, free-loving girl, or as the untrustworthy Asian menace to society. At the same time, the books, though very serious and intent, are often very funny. Susan's a witty writer and, uh, and, and very gently satirical. Uh, and she just has a good eye for American vanities and American foibles. And I, I love the section in which she describes a middle-aged English professor dressing up to look cool. Now, the word cool never passes through his consciousness, but she's clearly depicting a guy who's probably a couple two years too old to be wearing the clothes he's wearing. She writes from the points of view of men, women, children, teenagers, old people, straight people, not straight people, all of them making irresistible reading through the agency of her sumptuous imagination. Some of her characters are irascible and cranky, but somehow nevertheless appealing. Some are terrorists, some are professors. There are bomb makers in two different books, but we inhabit their visions with a powerful feeling of sympathy engendered by the intimate immersion in their passions, their desires, and their paranoias. She really is a magician and enticing readers to throw in their lots with characters they might otherwise choose to ignore or rebuke. She's now in mid-career, but she's already published a body of work that marks her as one of the most important, and I think in the long run, most influential writers of the 21st century in America. Susan Choi, welcome back to Cornell, and thanks for coming. Wow. Um, thank you, Stephanie. I'm really overcome by that amazing introduction. Um, thank you so much. It means a lot to me to be here and to be introduced by you. And um, I have to say, uh, of all your really kind words, um, that you find my work funny is super extra gratifying to me because you are the funny one, uh, Ms. Vaughn. <laughs> so if you think I'm funny, I'm feeling pretty good. So thank you. Um, and thanks everyone for being here. It's, it's great to be at Cornell, even virtually. I wish I could be there physically, but hopefully that'll, that'll come soon. Um, I'm going to read tonight from a short story of mine called flashlight. And, um, I'm going to read from the beginning and, um, I won't be able to read the whole thing, but I'll, I'll read, uh, a good chunk of it. So this is flashlight. One thing I will always be grateful to your mother for, she taught you to swim. Why? Not asked as a question, but groaned as a protest. Louisa does not want her father to talk about her mother. She is sick of her mother. Her mother can do nothing right. This is the theme of their new life in Louisa's opinion, that Louisa and her father are two fish who should leave her beached mother behind. They are making their way down the breakwater, each careful step on the heaved granite blocks, one step farther from the shore. Her mother is not even on the shore, seated, smiling on the sand. Her mother is shut inside the small, almost waterfront house they are renting, most likely in bed. All summer, Louisa has played in the waves by herself because her mother isn't well, and her father is invariably dressed in a jacket and slacks. Every day since they got here four weeks ago, she's asked her father to walk the breakwater with her, and tonight he's finally agreed. Spray from the waves sometimes lands on the rocks, so he's carefully rolled up the cuffs of his slacks, but he's still wearing his hard, polished shoes. In one hand, he holds a flashlight, which is not necessary. In the other hand, he holds Louise's hand, which is also not necessary. She tolerates this out of kindness to him. Because swimming is important to know how to do, he explains, for your safety. But when she gave you lessons, I thought it was too dangerous. I was very unfair. 
I don't care. I hate swimming. They both know that the opposite is true. Perhaps her father recognizes her comment for what it partly is, a declaration of loyalty to him, as well as for what it mostly is, a declaration by a 10-year-old child who is contentious by reflex without any reason. Far out over the water, far beyond where the breakwater joins with a thin spit of sand, the sunset has lost all its warmth and is only a paleness against the horizon. They'll turn back soon. I never learned to swim, her father reveals. Why? This time her tone is surprised, her question genuine. Because I grew up a poor boy. I had no YMCA. The YMCA is disgusting. I hate going there. (laughs) Someday you'll feel thankful to your mother, but... I want you to act thankful now. These are the last words he ever says to her. (laughs) Or are they just the last words that she can remember? Did he say something more? There's no one to ask. Louisa lay awake staring into the dark. The ceiling showed itself in a narrow stripe of light first sharp like a blade and then becoming softer and softer, which began at the door frame where the door was very slightly cracked open. The door was cracked open because Louisa was afraid of the dark. She didn't used to be. Louisa opened the door every night once she knew that her mother was well out of earshot. Once her mother, with maddening slowness, had made her retreat from the room, clumsily bumping her wheelchair into the door frame until Louisa wanted to scream at her. When her mother was finally out in the hallway, she'd hesitate, one hand on the doorknob, the door almost, but not fully shut. Close it all the way, please, Louisa would say in a sharp, grown-up tone. The first time she'd said this, it was because she couldn't stand another second of her mother being there, peering in through the crack, She'd said it every subsequent night in the same way because she'd realized that it was, without being a wrong thing to say, satisfyingly hurtful. (laughs) After she said it, there would be another brief hesitation, which Louisa didn't mind because it showed that her mother was indeed satisfyingly hurt. Apparently, her mother would have liked Louisa to ask for a story or a kiss as if Louisa were still five years old. Her mother never expressed this desire, but it was nakedly clear. Such naked wanting to be wanted made Louisa's mother even more repellent to Louisa than she generally was. The door would click into its frame heavily. It was the kind of solid American door that in the years she'd lived somewhere else, Louisa had almost forgotten existed, a door meant for closing. Then Louisa would lie in the dark, her unsparing mind tracking her mother's wheelchair down the hall and imagining hidden trapdoors hinging open beneath it. Meanwhile, the dark, like a snake, slid onto her chest, organizing its weight into neatly stacked coils that might bury her, crush her, if she didn't leap out of bed just in time and with deft skill silently reopen the door. Louisa was a master at handling the knob. She wasn't clumsy like her mother or thoughtless like her aunt. No sound escaped as the light was admitted, the darkness destroyed. Back to bed to gaze up at the stripe. Tonight, though, sound was admitted as well. She couldn't make out the words, but she didn't need to. She knew they were talking about her. This morning, instead of going to school on time, she'd been taken by her aunt to a building downtown to be examined by a child psychologist. No one had used those words, child psychologist. They had called it an appointment to talk about her grade level, which, at least at the start, she'd believed. On moving here to Los Angeles, she'd been put into fourth grade when she should have been a fifth grader. She'd been halfway through fourth grade when she and her parents had left the U.S. for a year in Japan. And during their time there, she'd finished fourth grade, done all the workbooks and readings and tests that her parents had brought on the trip. 
And she'd finished the Japanese fourth grade as well. She had done fourth grade twice in two countries and now was being made to do it over again, had been held back as if she had failed. The appointment had been in a brick office building with a half flight of stairs at the entrance. And as they climbed, her aunt had said, this is why your mom couldn't come with us because of these stairs. I called ahead to ask if there were stairs at the entrance and sure enough, they told me there were. Your poor mama. She's not sick, Louisa said. What's that, honey? Louisa was silent. I didn't hear you, honey. Now, Louisa could pretend that she hadn't heard. This was effective. No one was ever listening closely. Even people who especially claimed to be listening were not really listening. It was this way with the man at the appointment. My name is Dr. Brickner, he had said, making a show of bending down to shake her hand. He had already made a show of leaving her aunt in the waiting room and another show of reassuring Louisa that her aunt would be right there waiting for her, as if Louisa were in any fear that her aunt might disappear. Louisa's aunt was like a bright light that Louisa couldn't turn off. On the nights when Louisa's mother wasn't up to it, it was her aunt who tucked Louisa into bed and then lingered too long in the doorway. Louisa's aunt broadcast her kind disposition by constantly tilting her head to one side, crinkling her eyes and compressing her mouth as if to savor all the good tasting mirth trapped inside. Sometimes performing this face for Louisa, she added nostalgic comments about her two grown up sons and how precious it was to be reminded of them by Louisa's novel presence in her home. Louisa doubted her aunt felt this way. Until she and her mother had moved here, Louisa had never heard of this aunt or uncle. Her mother's brother, whom Louisa was now meant to pretend she'd known about her whole life. Her whole 10 years of life, during which she had never heard their names or seen their photos or received a card or a gift from them on her birthday, had never answered the telephone to hear either one of them ask for her mother or her father. Now she lived in their house and drank orange juice with them staring at her. They behaved toward her the way all adults had since her father had died, with a combination of hearty attention and squeamish discomfort. Brickner, just like this ugly brick building we're in, the man had added heartily. That's how you can remember. But my first name is Jerry, and I'd like you to just call me that. Can I call you Louisa? So I don't need to remember, she said. What's that? He pointed his grin at her. What'd you say? I said, I don't need to remember Brickner like this ugly brick building because you said I should just call you Jerry. The man reared back and raised his eyebrows. Let me guess, you're a very smart girl at least smart enough to be in fifth grade. Oh, I'll bet. Oh, I'm sure there's no doubt about that. Jerry blathered, not listening, which was how she had understood that this appointment was not about her grade level. The room was full of admittedly interesting things. Art supplies and those faceless wooden figures meant for posing as well as actual dolls of different sorts, ranging from the sloppy, floppy, raggedy Ann style to the realistic infant style with the hard plastic head, hands and feet, and a queasily soft trunk, arms and legs, to wild haired Barbies and those soldier Barbies for boys, the GI Joes. There was an intriguing, if off kilter dollhouse the kind that was meant to be played with and not just admired, with cluttered furnishings in slightly different sizes as if there had been a disagreement about which scale to use. Louisa knew about scale, about one foot equals one inch. Her father had made her a dollhouse the year she turned six. 
first grade had been the year of her passion for a store at the mall called It's a Small World, which sold elaborate miniature homes that she would gaze into, mesmerized, with the peculiar sensation of leaving her body and slipping in amid those wee wonderful things. Things she lacked the words for and so had to learn one by one. Fireplace irons and grandfather clocks and hat stands and claw-footed armoires. The young heroines in the books she liked most lived in such houses, full of little wooden knobs and dust ruffles and embroidery, each stitch as small as those tiny black seeds which are lofted by dandelion fluff. Every visit to the mall, Louise's mother gave her 20 minutes to browse in the store as a matter of policy, placidly ignoring her pleas that they actually buy something. Her father, by contrast, had needed her to plead only once. Off they had stormed to the mall, her father lambasting her mother's cheapness the entire drive there. Into the store, and immediately out he had stormed once he'd seen the first dollhouse price tag. I can make that, he'd said. The thin walls of hobby plywood had been tacked together with tiny nails that nevertheless caused the walls to split and splinter, their exposed front edges unsanded. The roof had been shingled with strips of a rough rubber matting that her father had found in the basement. Wallpaper scraps from the hardware store were cut down to size for the walls and the floor. He'd even built much of the furniture himself, sitting at the kitchen table night after night in his undershirt with a glass of beer near at hand and his pipe clamped beneath his, between his teeth while he cut strips of balsa and glued them to form the crude shape of a canopy bed. At first, Louisa had been horrified by the clumsy, indelicate house, though her horror was silent. Her father's labor awed and grieved her. He was toiling to make something ugly that she didn't desire. Yet somehow, over time, she'd realized that here, too, was the charm of the small. Her mother perhaps helped reveal it by sewing tiny pillows and bedspreads and the bed canopy, by showing Louisa that postage stamps could be put into brown cardboard frames to make art for the walls, that a length of embroidery yarn could be wound in a tight ball the size of a pea and pierced through with two straight pins in an X to look just like someone's miniature knitting. Then Louisa had spent hours on the floor, gazing into her strange handmade house. It had come to feel so like her home that the very few items within it that were consolatory gifts her parents had bought her from It's a Small World, the grand piano with its blue velvet bench, the four spindly chairs, looked out of place and inauthentic. Wrong. Louisa? She was startled to find Dr. Brickner just over one shoulder. She turned away from the dollhouse, stepping neatly around him and dropped into a chair. Moments before, during the introductions, the thing to do had been to shirk his eye contact and look at the things in the room that weren't him. Now he'd caught her looking interested in something, and the thing to do was to shirk that something and seem not to care about it. They were alone together, and no one had told her how long it would last. But let it last forever. She wouldn't give him anything. You can play with the dollhouse, he said. And she was pleased to hear a tinge of supplication. That's what it's there for. That's okay. Would you like to draw? I have terrific drawing stuff. That's okay. I don't really enjoy drawing. Right away, she regretted this offering. Sure enough, he nimbly caught on. Perhaps he was actually listening. What kinds of things do you enjoy? Certain adults could do this, Louisa had noticed. Instead of ooing or saying, you sound so grown up when you talk, 
these adults deftly plucked your words from the air and then flicked them back at you with a straight face as if they thought you might somehow become hypnotized. It was a game and not a playful type of game, but a competitive scorekeeping game. The quick witted adult snatching one bit of you after another. What's that flashlight for? Louisa asked him. And now his mind had to spring to you flashlight and pretend that the question was what he'd expected. The flashlight stood on the windowsill, bald end pointing down. The windows in the room were very large and high with deep sills, and the deep sills were very cluttered as every surface in the room was cluttered. There were potted plants set close together and in the space between them, ugly artworks made from balls and tubes of clay incompetently stuck together and other knick-knacky arts and crafts garbage that Louisa supposed other children made during their appointments. Amid all this, the flashlight hardly stood out and Dr. Brickner had to crane his neck around in awkward, almost panic to figure out what she was talking about. It's to see in the dark, he said clownishly. You have lights. He abandoned the clowning. It's in case of a power outage, which doesn't happen often, but it could happen, especially if there's an earthquake. Where I lived before I moved here, there were earthquakes all the time. In Japan. She was disappointed somehow that he already knew this, but of course he already knew everything. Can we turn out the lights? It won't be dark. You could pull the blinds down. It still won't be dark. It will be dim, Dr. Brickner predicted, but he was already doing it. The blinds were an ancient, unreliable mess and were clearly never closed. As Dr. Brickner, as Dr. Brickner struggled with them, they fought back, their long metal strips rattling and seesawing slantwise and releasing a dust plume before they seemed to surrender and fall all at once. The dust dissipating glinted erratically as if flashing a code as it crossed the slim rays of afternoon light that were streaming in through a, gra- through a gap where the blinds did not quite meet the wall. When her eyes adjusted, Louisa could see everything, but it was pleasantly dusky, so long as she didn't look straight into the needles of sun. Dr. Brickner, reaching over his desk toward the chair where he sat, held the flashlight out to her. It was surprisingly satisfyingly heavy. Louisa slid the plastic switch with her thumb and a pale cloud of light appeared on the ceiling. Oh, good, he said. I thought the batteries might have gone dead. If they had and this was an earthquake, then you'd be in trouble. Very true. She played the light over the ceiling, almost forgetting about him. The the ceiling was far above her, twice as far as the extinguished overhead light, which was the hideous kind that looked like a huge upside-down ice tray suspended from wires. Beyond the enormous ice tray, the faint pool of light ventured over the ceiling and slid down the wall. It seemed alive, a being both at her command and mysterious to her. Do, 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 she sang out, now inexplicably goofy herself. She was singing the five famous notes that everyone recognized lately, the UFO greeting from Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Dr. Brickner laughed. They gazed up at the ceiling as if something were actually there. Did you like that movie? Asked his voice, which she found was more tolerable than when she had to look at his face. It scared me. Her honesty surprised and annoyed her. Why? She shrugged, waving the flashlight beam over the ceiling as if in erasure. Just in a fun way, like Halloween stuff. Is that what you meant when you said that it scared you? She'd let the door open a crack. But he was too large and slow to slip through. She'd already closed it. She almost felt sorry for him. The hidden side of her contempt for adults was this pity that they imagined they understood her and then blundered so proudly while she had to pretend to be caught. She sang the alien greeting again, conducting with the flashlight to make a five-pointed star in the air. Did you like Star Wars? Dr. Brigner wondered. 
as if her taste in movies were what they were here to discuss. Sure. So you like sci-fi? This she couldn't allow. Close Encounters isn't sci-fi. Everything in that movie is normal. That's what makes the aliens feel really real. And that's scary. No, those aliens aren't scary at all. They seem nice. Then why would their being real scare you? It doesn't. And besides, when they land, they look fake. But you just said that they felt really real. He was onto something, his triumphant tone told her, as if he won a point for every little crack where her words didn't fit smoothly together. She swung the light onto his face and he squinted but didn't scold her, so she swung it away as a reward. I didn't. They don't. But the signs that they're coming, the weird radio sounds, the lights in the sky, the dad who builds the tower out of mud and his family thinks he's gone crazy. Maybe that felt really real? Louisa said nothing. Normal life turning strange? Did that feel really real? Are there things in your own life that might feel that way? Um, I think I'm going to stop there. Oh, Susan, thank you. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, it's, it's a wonderful, perfect story. Uh, those of you who haven't, haven't read it, it was published uh, last September in the New Yorker. I think it was September 27th. And you can go to the New Yorker and for free, you could read it. Uh, and you can also hear a recording of it for uh, free. In any case, uh, I encourage everyone to go to chat and ask a question. It can be about uh, Susan's work. It could be about her, uh, her graduate life at Cornell, uh, her life in Ithaca, her life at Yale, uh, anything that crosses your mind. I'd just like to ask a quick question about this wonderful story. You are a novelist, and <clears throat> you've got this character who's, who's just sort of heartbreakingly um, witty and uh, smart and um, uh, in, a, in her own little way dazzling. And I wonder if it's going to be enough to contain her in a story. Is she, is she, is she trapped in a little, little story? Um, or is this possibly going to be longer? Is it already something longer? What are you, what are you thinking about doing with Louisa? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I love your, I love your image of her un unwillingly trapped in a small story, the way she's unwillingly trapped in the child psychologist's office. Um, I really do hope to write more about her and about, um, her family. And, uh, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a fictional world that I've been preoccupied by for a while. Um, you know, this world of, well, I mean, obviously I've been preoccupied by it previously in my career, this world of the seventies, which is, um, you know, the setting for my novel American woman, but also the setting for my own childhood kind of continues to exercise a fascination over me and Louise is growing up in the seventies and, um, Things are sinister and strange. Uh, things are really real and kind of weird <laughs> in life, and um, and so I, I do hope I'll write more about her. I'm definitely, I'm definitely thinking about it. That's good news. I mean, she could be in another story, but I, I just wondered whether novelist was going to kind of be. And so it's not a novelist who writes little novels, but big substantial <laughs> novels was going to be satisfied with that. Well, we do have a couple of questions here, and um, the first one is from. Um, Amy Wong, who is the reporter for the Cornell Sun, and she says, um, <clears throat> Hi, Miss Choi. Thank you so much for your reading. Many of your previous novels have been inspired by historical events, uh, particularly in the U.S. in the latter half of the 20th century. Is there anything about this period that interests you um, especially? And I'm going to add, before you answer that, she has a follow-up question <laughs> In parentheses, also, I'm writing an article on this event for the Cornell Sun, 
So if anyone would prefer for me not to consider certain questions or answers for quotation in the article, please say so. Thank you all in advance. And she's here addressing the rest of you who might be submitting um, questions. Would it, do you mind being quoted in the uh, sign? Uh, so go back to the um, to the question. I think you partly answered it. Um, is there anything about this period that interests you especially? Yeah, thank you, Amy. That's a really interesting question. And um, yeah, there is there is stuff about the '70s that interests me particularly. But I, you know, I think I think to take it a little more broad, um, I do really love mining history for my fiction, and um, I've done it in a lot of my books. You know, my first book really came out of kind of the intersection of really personal concerns of mine, which, um, which were, you know, wanting to know my dad better, wanting to understand my dad's life before I knew him, um, when he was growing up in Korea and then, um, going through the Korean war and leaving that country and coming to this one. And, and so, you know, I had this very personal kind of mission to, uh, get to the bottom of his experience, but at the same time realized that I didn't even kind of know what questions to ask him or how to understand the things that he told me if I didn't do a lot of historical research. And that was kind of the beginning of my being really enamored of doing historical research for my fiction because, um, you know, honestly, like often historical events give me a certain amount of story structure that I struggle to come by otherwise. Um, I find historical research really generative because things that really happen are really interesting. And and often there's a lot of unanswered questions about the things that have really happened that um, I think it's interesting to try to answer in fiction. Um, And so I think it's actually lots of periods of the past, um, but the kind of recent enough that I feel a personal, a personal connection periods of the past that, that preoccupy me. I mean, you know, for my first book, it was the fifties for my second book. It was the seventies for my third book was the nineties kind of appears to be like a, a progression of, you know, two decades, every book. Um, but you know, it, I'm, I'm trying to work on something now that actually has me doing research about the thirties. So I'm going backwards. Um, but, uh, but you know, I think, I think, um, I think it's mostly an interest in interest in history and how history has like connected to parts of my life that motivates me more than like one particular time period. You know, with the Patty Hearst book, you you know, you take an entry into that story. Nobody else would have thought of. I mean, that's a much written about much filmed, much, much dramatized story. And the emphasis is always on this, this, this poor girl, uh, and 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 her kidnapping and and the puzzling things that uh, seem to come out of that. But you picked this other character, and um, I wanna and you you're very faithful um, to the whole narrative. And I wondered what it was like, or what is it like when you have done historical research and you want to be faithful to the facts, and yet um, you've got this template that's up there, so to speak. It's as if you have a map. And are you, how do you stay with the map? And can you, does it just, is it like having to wear a school uniform and it solves all the problems of dressing in the morning (laughs) and you can relax for the rest of the day? That's so funny because I've I've always like, yeah, I've always wanted, I mean, when um, I very briefly attended a school, very briefly attended a school that had a uniform and I just loved it. I was like, this, I thought it was just great. It, it solved that problem of like what to, what to wear in the morning. And then you could, you know, dress it up a little. And yeah, with, I mean, I think with um, basing fiction on historical events, you know, the, the, the historical events do solve certain problems. I think if you, if you choose them carefully, because, you know, you can home in on a series of events that, that seem like particularly, um, just fruitful for getting at character and getting at like what the characters are going through. But, you know, the, there's a flip side too, which is that um, it's restrictive, you know, and, uh, Mm -hmm. and, and writing, writing American women, which is the novel that's based on the Patty Hearst kidnapping. um, I wanted it both ways, right? Like I kind of wanted to use real historical events that I thought were just sort of too good not to use. And I also like wanted to, uh, 
wanted to shape the narrative the way I wanted to, you know, I wanted to both keep things and change things, which is the fun of writing fiction. Like you get to do that, but it's also confusing because, you know, then like, what are the ground rules? And um, I feel like I was inventing them as I wrote with that book. And I've never quite, I've never quite, you know, decided if those ground rules that I invented were, were the right ones, I guess, you know, I hope they I th- were. I, I think they were. I think, they, I think the <laughs> success of that book in particular, all the books really, but certainly that one, surely. Uh, and now it's a film. Um, okay. The more, a couple more questions have come in. Um, I can't tell who sent this. Is it from Christopher Wolford? Maybe. Uh, Susan, is the protagonist autobiographical? And I think this must refer to the story. Is that smart little kid? (laughs) (laughs) Is that smart little kid? Smart little kid, you? Smart Susan. Um, You know, like certainly, certainly in like a broad sense, no, because um, Louisa has uh, experienced a trauma in her life that she is unable to articulate or even acknowledge. Um, and that's what that story tries to be about. Um, and if I expand on that material, which I, which I hope to, um, it will investigate that traumatic event more, Mm -hmm. more thoroughly. And, you know, I'm happy to say that there's no basis in my life or experience for the, for the, yeah, for the events I've imagined for her. Um, you know, but on the flip side of it, uh, yes, I will admit that there's a certain amount of, um, too smart for her own good uh, uh, um, stuff drawn from, you know, certain memories that I have of, of grownups who talked to me, like not quite in the right way, you know, like grownups who did make me feel incredibly self-conscious and embarrassed um, about being a good student or about being well-spoken um, about knowing, you know, words that, uh, they didn't think a nine-year-old or a 12-year-old should know, um, you know, all, all of which is, 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 is not to say that I was some like, you know, child genius. I definitely wasn't. Um, in fact, one of the, one of the memories that I drew on to, to sort of flesh out this encounter between Louise and Dr. Brickner was a very, very different encounter that I do remember having as a child with, um, the kind of child psychologist who specializes in whether or not a kid is smart enough to skip grades and like oh. be, you know, be promoted to the next grade up despite their age. And um, I don't remember much about the appointment, but I, I was not deemed, <laughs> I was not. They, skipped grade. they, they didn't help. No, they didn't hold me back. They just, they were like, she's fine where she is. She's fine where she is. They're like, you know, she's six. She's in first grade. That's fine. <laughs> Let her stay there. Yeah. Oh, kids always regret having skipped. But I mean, they miss miss a lot of social stuff. Yeah. Yeah. They were smart to keep you there. Uh, this is from Victoria Armstrong. Um, beautiful reading. Thank you. I wonder how hard it is to leave your characters once you are done with the novel and move on to new characters for the next work. Do you miss your characters at all? And I guess another part of that question would be, is there anybody you want to return to? <laughs> That's a really, I love that question. Thank you, Victoria. I really like that question. Um, I don't, you know, usually it takes me so long to finish a book, like really a pretty long time that by the time I finally finish, I'm, I'm not that interested <laughs> in ever, um, ever returning to these characters in writing. Like I, I don't want to write about them anymore. But I do like them. I do continue to like them. And and I enjoy uh, opportunities to talk about them as if as if they're people because I do I do miss their company and think about them. I just don't want to write about them anymore. Um, You know, a great example would be the film adaptation of American Woman, um, Hmm. which um, was adapted by my my dear friend and, you know, brilliant, brilliant, like writing comrade, Semi Chellis, who also was at Cornell. And um while Semi was developing the screenplay, like there's nothing more fun for me than to sit around and just like shoot the breeze with her about the characters. It was so great. Cause like we got to talk about them, but I, I didn't have to do the writing. Uh, so that I, was like perfect. Did I notice, do you have a writing credit? I thought you might, I thought I saw that you had a writing credit. No, 
No, oh. I should. I certainly shouldn't because uh, I didn't. I didn't have to write. Mm. I didn't that's have to write that movie, funny. which that's I just funny. loved. That's I love terrific. not having to write it. Yeah, that's terrific. Um, I'm not sure I'm seeing another question. Um, you guys, this is your chance to ask a question of Susan Choi. Um, <clears throat> well, I have have some have some questions. Um, Actually, um, well, you, you know, now that you're talking about America Woman, I'm wondering when you saw your work in a different medium. I mean, we all love movies. Everybody wants to sell something to the movies. I mean, writers, fiction writers do because you could make money. And even if the movie doesn't make money, maybe more people will go back and buy the book. But isn't it strange to see what's cast in language on the page shrunk? to movie size and given a completely new shape and rhythm. It is was it's that really, an exhilarating experience or was it alarming at times or how did it, I know you're working with your close friend, but the work itself has got to change under the pressure of, of being uh, transformed into film and a short, yeah. I think it's an 85 minute film. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, yeah, it's a, it's lean, mean, it's a lean, mean machine, that film. It, um, it is, it goes, it goes by very, very quickly, um, and rewards rewatching, I have to say. Mm. Um, you know, it was an incredible experience watching that movie for the first time. I, you know, I experienced kind of the delight of, uh, of periodic recognition, very periodic recognition. Like <laughs> I was really absorbed in the film and periodically, I would recognize a scene or even a line as, as something that I had created. And I would go, Oh, <laughs> it was like, I was completely like kind of shocked and surprised. It's um, mm-hmm. it's, I don't even know what to compare it to. Maybe like drawing up elaborate blueprints and then forgetting about them and then mm-hmm. walking around in a house one day and suddenly realizing like, this is the house, like mm-hmm. this is the house that I did yeah. the blueprints for, but I didn't, you know, I never really knew what it would be like walking around in three dimensions. That's a good analogy. There it is. Yeah. yeah, it was, it was, it was it's thrilling. Completely new. And the ways in which it conformed to my imagination were exciting and the ways that it diverged were really exciting. Um, mm-hmm. You know, and the, and things emerged from the story that just because someone else was interpreting it, things emerged that I hadn't really thought about or hadn't really intended that were actually much I have to say much smarter <laughs> than, than I had realized that the book was about certain issues. Excellent. Okay. From Tricia. Um, I'm curious about your time at Cornell and the creative writing program. How did the anticipations and hopes that emerged from that experience map to the reality of your past? Also my favorite faculty members that you re- any favorite faculty members that you remember from your time at Cornell <laughs> well, the one that I'm talking to, of course. Um, I mean, I loved, I loved pretty much everybody that I worked with at Cornell and, uh, gosh, you know, it was, um, it was, it was such a, it was such an interesting and amazing time for me as a writer, because I really, I, I arrived in Ithaca really having no idea what I was doing as a writer at all. Um, and I think a lot of, a lot of my, a lot of my experience was kind of realizing that no one is going to be, um, no one is going to be the writer for you, but you, you know, you're, you have to do it. Um, I, I love, I really liked the language of this question, but could you repeat it, Stephanie? There was a, there was a phrase about mapping. How did things map onto the day? anticipations and hopes that emerged from that experience? I think it's, it's, it's I think I'm going to correct it a little bit. It might be in the typing. How did the anticipation and hopes that emerged from that experience map to the reality of your path? You know, so you came here with one idea. Yes. uh, Yeah. So I, so that's, it's a great question because I think one of the things that was really interesting about the ideas that I arrived with um, versus kind of the path that I ended up on. It's like something that you noticed, Stephanie, like as soon as we started talking, which was um, short fiction versus long fiction, right? So when I arrived at the program, my whole focus was was short fiction. And I remember our, our whole focus, I think, as writers um, 
was, was on short fiction because there was so much amazing short fiction that I had read in college that I was really, really influenced by that I was discovering at Cornell. I still vividly remember Dennis Johnson coming and reading Mm -hmm. while we were at Cornell and we had all like gone crazy for Jesus' son. It was like our Bible kind of like Mm -hmm. we read that. I read that collection over and over again, Um, Mm -hmm. his collection of short stories and he read from it. And that was a, that was an unforgettable um, experience for me. And And so I think one of the things that really happened at and after Cornell was that I slowly understood that I wasn't, I mean, Flashlight notwithstanding and a couple of other stories that I've published in my career, realizing that I wasn't a short fiction writer primarily, Mm -hmm. that I was actually a novelist. And it was a really hard um, lesson to learn uh, because novel writing, you know, and as somebody who's now taught for like 20 odd years and constantly encounters this question from students and never has a better answer for them. Like, how do you write a novel? And I'm always like, I don't know, kids, like, I have no idea. You know, I've, I've like, every time I've done it, it's been like by accident. I don't know how it happens and it's never the same. Um, so I think that that was the major, like kind of artistic discovery for me at and after Cornell was like this, this romance with the short story, this intense focus on the short story. And then mm-hmm. it's kind of like not, there just wasn't a fit between me and the short story, even though I wrote, I wrote short fiction the whole time I was there, mm-hmm. but it was never quite what I wanted it to be. And there mm-hmm. was a reason. It's true. I mean, we, we often have novels up in the workshop, but you were here with a lot of short story writers and they were people who went on to publish collections of short story writers. So maybe there was a sort of in- inadvertently pressure to 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 write short but you know even i rem- i vividly remember my very my very first workshop um we one of the very first things we workshopped was a novel in progress and i remember being sort of awestruck by this like phenomenon this person in the workshop was like writing a novel um <laughs> it didn't yeah it 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 was it was clearly present as an option stephanie i just didn't <laughs> i just I'm didn't understand to- that it was my option until later um uh <clears throat> Christina says, trust exercise felt in some ways like a critique of autofiction. Do you have strong feelings about the genre? Hmm. Interesting. Wow. Hmm. You know, autofiction is a genre that um, I, I spend a lot of time asking people to explain to me what it is. And when they do, and, and everyone always explains it differently. Although I think the writer Sigrid Nunez, who um, is one of my favorite writers and people, and I interviewed her recently for a piece about her that I was writing. And she defined autofiction to me as, you know, being a fiction in which the I is a writer, um, is engaged in writerly pursuit is identifiable with the author, but that the events of the narrative are not necessarily those of the author's life. Um, Cause that would be a memoir. And I was like, is that what autofiction is? Like I thought it was, I thought it was the most cogent definition of autofiction I'd ever heard. And so that's now what I'm thinking in response to your question. And I would say, I certainly didn't have that in mind while I was writing trust exercise. Um, I didn't have it in mind to critique autofiction and I probably had only just started being aware of autofiction as a genre. Um, and I like it, you know, and if Rachel Cusk is a writer who is exemplary of autofiction, I think she is often cited as one. I mean, I think her work is fabulous. I love it. Um, and so, uh, I'm kind of excited by the idea that trust exercise has auto fiction vibes um, <laughs> because I like auto fiction and, uh, but I wouldn't have been critiquing it. I only hope to understand it someday. Well, it, it's a book that draws so much attention to its structure and to point of view. You forget that there is a point of view. Usually when you're reading a novel, you forget that you're in a point of view, but this yeah. book insists that you notice and yeah. so in, in that way, it seems to be a little bit about writing. And maybe that's why someone would suggest that it's a critique. But then books have minds of their own. And maybe the book itself wants to be a critique of, of fiction writing, something the author might not have intended. 
I mean, the, the, the book has definitely, the, the book definitely really does have a mind of its own, that book. It's, it's about many things that I did not understand that it was about until much later after it was not just finished, but published. Okay. We have just a few minutes left and let me ask um, that. Uh, oh gosh. Um, who are your favorite authors? This is uh, Susan. Who are your favorite authors and who has most influenced you? I don't know if you could do this quickly. And of course, nobody really can give a favorite author list, but could you name maybe a couple dead people if you don't want to um, name the living? <laughs> Leave somebody I can, out. <laughs> I can definitely name some dead people that I like. Um, you know, I it's but it is it is a question that I actually uh, think about a lot and always sort of draw a panicked blank. But, you know, in terms of, in terms of authors that have been really influential to me, um, you know, a couple come to mind almost immediately because their books sort of were like guardian angels over books that I was trying to write. Weirdly enough, um, George Eliot's Middlemarch was mm. a book that I mm. was constantly reading while I was writing my first novel, which bears no resemblance to Middlemarch mm -hmm. at all. But the project of Middlemarch, and I just think the presence of Eliot in those pages as this kind of, um, the, the, the warmth of her third person omniscient narration, like the way in which she infuses that, that narration with, a, with this compassionate concern for all of her characters was like really, really um, influential and moving to me and, and kind of, you know, like on my shoulder, like thinking about her a lot. Um, Virginia Woolf was a huge influence on me in college to such an extent that I wrote horrible, horrible derivative <laughs> Wolfian stuff and had to kind of get it out of my, my system. But I love, love and venerate Woolf for what she did and does in her work. And I reread her as often as I have time. And um, this year, actually, I, I read her first novel, the voyage out for the first time. Cause I had spent all these decades rereading like to the lighthouse and, um, and the waves and, you know, room of one's own. And I'd never read the voyage out. And, uh, and so I, I was like, Oh my God. <laughs> so I finally read that and it's great. Um, and you know, else is there anybody else that I should say? I think Elliot and Wolf are pretty. That's pretty good. Uh, well, you know, I would, I would, I would link you right away to George Elliot. I'm glad you mentioned her. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a, a sensibility there that's uh, sympathetic. Um, Amy Wong, uh, maybe you could answer this quickly because we're running out of time, but she says, would you, and I think a lot of students, writers would be interested in this, would you say <clears throat> that there are any unique challenges or aspects of, or of interest in, to writing from the perspective of a child as opposed to one of, of an adult? And what do you have to think about in order to create a kid narrator that grown-ups can read yeah well it's extremely challenging because you um you want to actually uh write a child and not you know um like an adult in a child's body and experience louisa i you know is is a bit of a cheat i have to say it's like there's a reason that the precocious child character is irresistible for writers because um you you know you have half the solution to the knowledge problem, right? If your protagonist is a child and their knowledge is limited by the experience of a child, it's a storytelling uh, challenge, right? So if you have a precocious child, they have more knowledge. It helps with the storytelling. Um, <laughs> either that or like I would say, as I say to my students, I'm like set your perch or your point of, of telling the story in the future and, and make it retrospective. Then, you know, you can write about the child from the perspective of that all-knowing, experienced adult, and that's you can, easier. You can use big words. You can use big words, yes. Uh, Susan, thank you. I mean, this has been wonderful. It seems too short. We it want does. We to come back again sooner. Yes, um, when, when we can do it you. in person. Uh, yes, and we'd like you to come back in person, and I'm serious about that. We're going to try to figure out how to do that. Uh, once we reopen, I love that notion, we're going to open uh, thanks to you. Thanks to the Zelaznicks. Thanks to E. Cornell and Christopher Wolford uh, for producing um, and to everyone for attending. Uh, the next Zelaznick reading will be by Carolyn Forche, poet, uh, on Thursday, April 29, 7 p.m. And Carolyn Forche, Forche is a pretty big name. And, um, uh, and I think she'll be almost as interesting as a uh, fiction writer, Susan Joy. So I encourage you. Uh, so much to more come. interesting. 
Kunichi. She's an amazing writer. Yeah, I, <laughs> yes, I, she I is. Love and she's a good reader, and uh, I think everyone will enjoy her reading. I mean, she's it'll be a great performance. We hope to see you all again. Thanks for coming, and thank you, Susan. Thanks, Stephanie. It was really fun to be here. Okay.